all is well tiffany here welcome to part i don't know what part we're on for the marriage fast but we're here that's all that matters so uh in case you don't know you have joined our marriage fast god has let us know that 2022 is the year of the bride. There was a prophetic word I gave back in October, 2021. You can find that word on somewhere on my YouTube page. It's literally said the, the word of the Lord for 2022, something like that. But God told us that this would be the year of the bride. There were two parts to that word, right? There was the part for physical marriages and also God's agenda for his church. And so if you would like more information, more in-depth information on that, please find that on my YouTube page somewhere. It is labeled the year of the bride. With that prophetic word, however, God let us know that there would also be um, mad men. And I remember saying that back in October, not really knowing why I said it, not really feeling like it was the place to say it in that specific live, but being obedient, I said it anyway. And um, what I said was, I don't even remember what I said, but I know, I know I said something about Mad Men coming in 2022. I did not have the revelation about that until like a few months ago. And what I understood is a lot of people get prophetic words. A lot of people rest in their prophetic words, which is beautiful. But the truth is we ought to be contending for these prophetic words to come to pass. And whenever the Holy Ghost releases something uh, whenever the spirit of God releases a prophetic word over you, the enemy is going to come with the very opposite of that word to counter attack what God is doing. So isn't it just like the devil? If God releases a word saying that this is the year of the bride where these men, and it was like not normal marriages, not normal weddings, right? This was going to be like, and like you were going to know that this is God, like the hand of God is moving because so many people were getting married at such a rapid pace. Well, wouldn't the enemy just come in with the madman spirit to make all of your husbands lose their minds, right? Like that's just like the devil. And I remember saying in that live specifically, I remember saying, I know you guys have been seeing like madman spirits, but you're not going to see anything compared to what's getting ready to happen. And so I think like in normal years, we see suicides, we see men killing their families or, you know, those stupid things. But I remember saying that we were going to see it in a, in such a way that you knew it was demonic. Like you knew that this was the devil. And just the opposite is going to take place with the year of the bride that you're going to see so many um, kingdom marriages take place that you're going to know without a doubt only the hand of God could have done this. Well, obviously we are seeing um, the madman spirit running rampant, which we know just from doing these fasts, the spirit of the Lord has been revealing to us that it's really rooted in the spirit of pride, Leviathan, um, the same thing Nebuchadnezzar uh, died from, was killed from, I think he killed himself. I don't know. He went crazy. Same thing saw, you know, went off, off because of, you know, these are madmen spirits and it is rooted in a strong spirit of Leviathan, a strong spirit of the king of pride. It's also rooted in stubbornness and rebellion. The Bible says that rebellion is likened unto witchcraft and stubbornness is like iniquity and um, an idol. And so these things are a lot more serious than you could ever imagine. And uh, what is the solution of that? The solution is obviously humbling yourself, putting on the garment of humility, repenting for the spirit of pride and allowing God to heal that um, heart and part of your heart so that you can walk in humility. There are many people in the body of Christ, leaders that deal with the spirit of pride, right? And God wants to kill that. One of the ways to kill the spirit of pride, I, I think the best way, the easiest way, I think is the reason that God has us on these fasts all the time, is the power of prayer and fasting. It is the power of prayer and fasting. When you fast, when you pray, fasting by nature kills our flesh, right? And it's the flesh. It's the, it's the what is it? The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, right? These things are dealing with your flesh. It's what your flesh wants, which is always opposite of what God wants for you. Well, when you fast, you're killing your flesh. You're killing what this thing that has become an enemy against God wants, and you're humbling it. You're telling it, 
you know, you've been God in my life, lowercase g, for a very long time now. When you say masturbate, I masturbate. When you say cuss somebody out, you cuss somebody out. When you say uh, steal something out in the store, you steal. Like your flesh has been running you for a very long time now, right? And when you're fasting, what you're saying is, I am making God, um, God, big case G, Lord over my life again. I'm making God Lord over my decisions, Lord over my passions, Lord over my desires, Lord over my flesh. I'm giving God rule, reign, and dominion over my life again. And I'm declaring a ceasefire against my flesh. Anything in my life that does not glorify God, you got to die. This is what fasting does. It kills the thing that's an enemy against God. Fasting, I believe, is the only way to get it done. The Bible even declares that some things only come out by prayer and fasting. Some things only come out by prayer and fasting, which means that those things in your life that you have been praying, bombarding heaven for, you've been sowing your seeds, you've been believing God for, and it's not been budging, turn down your plate, go on a three-day fast, go on a seven-day fast, go on a whatever God, the Holy Ghost is leading you to, go on that fast, abstain from all food for a certain period of time. I believe that we've gotten in a generation of people who think that you can fast from TV, fast from you know sweets and all of that stuff, but that is not a biblical definition of a fast. The biblical definition of a fast is to abstain from all food for a certain period of time. I think it's not strange that the very first sin in the Bible was related to food. And so I believe that there's a correlation of why God wants us to turn down our plate because, I mean, just think about it. Whenever most people get upset or frustrated, the first thing they run to is their God, lowercase g, which is food. And let me tell you something. I know many of you don't know this, but you will not die if you don't eat. Now, your flesh will die, You'll get very angry. You'll be very frustrated. You'll be very irritable. You might get headaches. Your body might act up because it's used to being God. And now you told it that another God was in town. You know, those things might happen, but you will not die if you go on a fast. I, it, it, you're not going to die. Your flesh will die, but you won't. Okay. And so that is what we're doing every Tuesday. We partner with God for the prophetic word that he give, gave us, and we fast between the hours of 6 a.m. and 3 p.m., uh, whatever your time zone is, and we pray corporately on YouTube at 12 p.m. So please lock it in your calendar from now on. It is what it is. We have, um, we have made a promise to God that we would do this for the rest of the year. So even if I'm not able to come on YouTube this whatever week, that does not Resolve you of the responsibility of turning down your plate from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. and bombarding heaven for um, marriages and for this madman spirit to completely disappear because it is of the devil. It is not of God. And your husband will have your his right mind and your wives will have her right mind as well. Because, you know, some of them going a little bit crazy as well. You know what I'm saying? It's cuckoo. Anyway. That was a lot of information. If you want the detailed email of these fasts, because baby, I lay it out, okay? If you want, want the detailed emails, go to coveredbygod.co. Again, that is coveredbygod.co. One more time, coveredbygod.co. Go there, put your email address in that website, um, check your spam folder because a lot of the times the emails land over there. And if you're a Gmail user, check your promotional folder as well because I want you to make sure that you get the details for the emails. And we also fast for the first three days of every single month. We've been doing that for a few years now. One thing I know about God, right, is that I don't know everything about God. But one thing I know for sure is that even when God tells you to fast, you might not know why he's telling you to fast, but there's protection in fasting and there's provision in being obedient to God. And so I have, uh, you know, I have not been with God for long. I just got saved in 2015. But in this journey with God, I have at least understood that I will be obedient even when God hasn't given me the next set of instructions. Um, I trust God that much. And, um, and that's just what it is. And I have found, I can testify that I have been provided for and I have been protected in ways that, you know, are very astounding to be very honest. So, um, so yeah, that's just the caveat I have for marriages. One of the, or for this fast, I mean, and before I get into the lesson for today, I want to say this, the marriage, 
Marriages that God is speaking about is a lot different than the marriages I think many of us are used to. And I think a lot of us, you know, fortunately and unfortunately have not seen marriages. And I say fortunately because a lot of the marriages that people have seen are very toxic and that's the only um, indicator of what a marriage is, right? Of a woman emasculating a man or a Jezebelic and uh, Ahab spirit, which means that one person is very authoritative and the other, and the man is very submissive to his wife. And that's not the order of God. Um, you know, we've seen abusive marriages. We've seen marriages that have been abandoned, full of adultery and things of that nature. Um, and so these marriages that God is doing is much different from that. And I want everybody that has joined these fasts to at least do a staple of studying Jeremiah 16 and Jeremiah 33. And what I know for sure is that whenever you see a lack of marriages in a bloodline, in a region, in a church or anything of that nature, um, that is indication that a curse is at work. You can find this in the book of Jeremiah 16. Now, I know that many of you say, hey, well, Tiffany, that's Old Testament. It doesn't um, you know, mean anything for today. And I just don't have the strength to argue with you right now. I've argued with you in a few other lives prior to that, but you know, but anytime you don't see marriages flourishing, it is indication that a curse is at work. You will find evidence of this in Jeremiah 16. When they had gone into idolatry, God made their land desolate. And God said, proof that your land is desolate is that you're no longer going to hear the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of mirth, which is like happiness. And you're no longer going to hear the voice of the bride or the bridegroom. Now, the reason I believe God did this is because whenever you have two people that have come together as one, the main purpose of that is unity. The main purpose of that is intercession. The main purpose of that is agreement, right? The power of agreement, where God now has a couple that has become one that can now command things to come on earth, the kingdom come on earth as it already is in heaven. And because God knows how powerful it is, we might not know how powerful it is, but because God knows how powerful that is he says because i know that this couple can make this land um you know prosperous again i'm going to divide the husband and wife and because i'm going to curse this land i can no longer afford these two people to be together because their agreement is going to stop what i'm doing which is y'all been bad y'all been ser serving another god so you know if the, if the grass is green on the other side, God said, you go serve that God. How about that? And I'm going to take the two people that I know can really make something happen on this land. I'm going to wipe them on out. That's why he did that, right? And then, you know, I want you to take some time to read in between Jeremiah 16 and 33. But then you're going to hop over to Jeremiah 33. They repented for their sins. And God said, because of that, this land that was so dead. Desolate. And I want you to Google the word desolate. Let me do it for you while I'm here. I want you to look up the word desolate. Desolation. So desolate is a, des is a place of deserted of people and in a state of bleak and dismal emptiness. It is depressingly empty. It is bare. It is barren, right? So it is a desert. It is inhospitable. It is uninhabited. It is unoccupied. It is depopulated. It is forsaken. It is God forsaken. These are, it is abandoned. It is evacuated. It is all of those things, right? What is the opposite of desolate, Fer fertile and populous? So God says that this place that was once barren, once empty, once void of people, void of life, not even greenery could grow out of it. Not even a dog could live in this place. He said, because of the repentance for idolatry, um, I'm going to now put on this land the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bride and the voice of the bridegroom. If you ever read that scripture and you wonder why, like, God, this is so random that, you know, this place that was desolate, you're now restoring it. And you're saying that proof of restoration is the fact that you brought the voice of the bride and the bridegroom back. It doesn't make sense. Well, it does make sense because God needs the kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the most powerful two people that can make that happen is the wife and husband team that God has partnered together because their main um, job together is intercession, coming together as one and operating in unity. And so 
Whenever you see God restoring a land, you will see marriages pop up. You will see marriages begin to take place. You will see marriages begin to do all these things. So when God says that this is the year of the bride, I personally believe he's doing that because kingdom needs to come on earth as it already is in heaven. And God is partnering these people together to restore bloodlines, to restore regions, to restore lands, to restore nations, to restore villages, to restore um, states and countries. And he can do that when he has two kingdom people operating in purpose who are, um, who are uh, filled with you know the love of God, the fear of God, and understand their divine purpose and are walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. So hope that made sense. Let me get through today's lesson. I did this over on Instagram. If you're not following me on Instagram, what are you waiting for? Go to at Tiffany Montgomery on Instagram at T-I-P-H-A-N-I -I Montgomery. And also let me say this about restoration, right? Because restoration, one of the marks of rest that your life has been restored is in a certain area is speed. So restoration is often accompanied by speed because God is restoring to you the years that the canker worm, the palmer worm, and the locust stole from you. If you ever did a study on the canker worm and the locust, those are three things that cause desolation in the land. So when God is restoring these, these years that were stolen from you, you know, there is restoration that's taking place to take you from what took years out of your life. And God says, I'm going to speed you up to where you should be. That is the miraculous power and the miraculous favor of the of the rest of, restorative power of God is marked by speed. It is marked by speed. It is marked by speed. So you don't have to worry that, you know, you've lost time because of your own stupidity, because of your own sin, because you've made people an idol, your life an idol, whatever an idol you have, uh, you know, an idol is what you love more than your obedience to God. You have made that thing an idol. And so uh, many of us can look at our lives and if we are humble ourselves and tell ourselves the truth, I'm sure that you can point out three to five things that you've made an idol or in other words, those things that you have loved more than your obedience to God. And then you can kind of look at your life and see where it's desolate or barren at in certain areas. And during this fast, it's really important for you to repent to God and ask him to forgive you for your stupidity and ask God to mark your life by the favor of speed that is accompanied by his power of restoration. Okay, so I did a live yesterday on, on Instagram. It was fire and it deleted. But what I know for sure is somebody on Instagram needed to hear that. You know what I'm saying? So I ain't all too mad about it. But anyway, uh, during our three-day fast, our last three-day fast, God told me that this month was the month. He said, there shall be a performance, right? God began to tell me that there shall be a performance, you can find that in Luke 145, and we'll get there in a second. There will be a performance. And um, I remember I was during, during the fast, you know, I was praying and I was like meditating before God. And I heard the Lord say that, Tiffany, this is halftime. This is halftime. And uh, I, did, I don't think I made a correlation between this being half, we're halfway through the year and God saying that this is halftime. Now, I want to say this in case you're going to watch this live later on in the year, because this can apply anytime you need God to course correct you in a situation that you feel like you've made a wrong decision in. But specifically because we're in the half of the year, I want to talk about this. I heard the Lord say that we are in halftime. This month is very pivotal to the next few, uh, you know, for the rest of the year. Now, what do I mean by we are in halftime? Now, whenever you're watching a game, and I'm not a sports fan, but your girl was a little, you know, sports enthusiast. Let me know. So I used to run 100 meter hurdles, okay? I was fast. I used to be on a swim team. I was fast. I used to be on a diving team until I hit the water wrong and I never went back to that diving board. You know when you hit the water wrong, it's like you hit concrete. You know you can get a concussion. On, you know you can break your face when you hit the water wrong. And I used to play basketball. I was a point guard. Don't play with me. I know I don't look athletic. I know I haven't worked out in 57 years. But I want you to know that I know a little bit about halftime, and that's why God spoke to me in sports terms. And I know how to double dutch. Okay. 
And let me tell you something. I stopped playing on the swim team because they, I started looking at those girls and they was like a little bit shaped like fish. You know, they had like the bigger upper body and then they started going down like a fin and I was like, oh, heck no. Oh, I'm not going to want a fish body when I get older. So that's actually the reason I stopped playing swimming. And you know why I stopped playing basketball? Because I noticed that they had a principality of lesbianism over it, and I wasn't gay, okay? And I was like, it's a strong principality of lesbianism over this basketball team. I wouldn't even let my daughter play basketball, and she's very tall. And I was like, you won't get me, okay? Even when I was in high school, I knew that. I was like, now, I don't know what all that was for, but I just felt like sharing because we're here, and I'm doing a YouTube, and I just felt like you should know that. You know what I'm saying? Like, why would you know? Anyway, this is why God talked to me in halftime terms because I know halftime. <laughs> anyway, so whenever you're watching a game, right, or any type of sports, right, if you see a sports team and they're like 100 points down, right, and you can do like a Google search of some of the greatest comebacks after halftime. These teams were 100 points down, 50 points down, 70 points down. It looks like they cannot win the game. It looks like Everything is stacked against them. They're so flustered. They're so frustrated. Everything is losing. They go into halftime. We don't know what magic happened in halftime. We don't know what was said during halftime. We don't know what happened in there. But what we do know is that when they come out of halftime, it is a landslide victory for the team that once looked like they were losing. That's what God began to speak to me about. He was like, it doesn't look, it does not matter how bad it looks like you're losing. It doesn't matter how, it does not, none of that matters. This is the month of halftime. And this is the month where you can come back for the rest of the year with your greatest win. This is the month that you can come back with your greatest win. It does not matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what it look, if it looks like the other team or your opposition is molly whopping you all over the place. It does not matter. One thing um, I noticed about halftime, I just did like a little bit of study of it. Anytime I hear God talking to me about something, I just kind of, I like to look deeper into it because I'm like, if he's talking to me about halftime and I think I know about halftime, I'm sure it's something else about halftime he wants me to know. And so one of the things I studied was that like during regular games, halftime is usually like seven and a half minutes, right? But during the Super Bowl, halftime is 30 minutes minutes. So what I realized was that the bigger the game, the longer the halftime. I'll say that one more time. The bigger the game, the longer the halftime. And guess what? This month is 30 days, just like Super Bowl. So I don't know what God has planned for your life, but it's going to be big and there is going to be a performance. And because the game is big, because the win is going to be big, your halftime is a little longer than normal. So this month, I want you to posture yourself as it is halftime, okay? This is your halftime month. And I'm gonna give you instructions on what to do during your halftime months. But let, let me explain to you what's common during your halftime months, right? So what's common for some of the players during halftime is that they have random bursts, outbursts of emotions. They have heated altercations in the locker room. They're very frustrated. So it is not unusual that you are showing frustration during this month. It's not unusual that you're aggravated. It's not unusual that you are you know, arguing with people and th things of that nature. During halftime, you normally have outbursts of emotions. You're normally very frustrated. You normally are fighting with people all over the place. Um, and that is just normal. Doesn't make it right, but it's normal, right? And so when you go in, and, and also what's common during halftime is that you're getting bandaged up. And so a lot of the times when you're playing the game, you get beat up, you have battle fatigue, you know, you have war wounds all over the place. And so while you're in halftime, you know, there's some outbursts of emotion some type of altercations. Um, some of you are getting bandaged up from the war wounds that you experienced out on the on the battlefield or on the playing grounds. And um, and that's what it is. But what happens during halftime while all of those things are happening? First of all, matchups are, res are reshuffled. So one thing I love about halftime is that while you're playing the game, right? So this is for you for the first six months of this year, God gave you some promises, right? You sat before God, you, you, you heard the word of the Lord concerning your life. God gave you some promises. Here you are halfway through, you don't see the promises, but you've been playing the game. You've been joining all the fast. You've been praying. You've been seeking God's face. You're like, what is going on? But if you are the player, you can't see the blind spots. 
If you're the player, you cannot see the blind spots, right? All you're doing is focused on the next play, but you don't have an eagle eyes view on what, what's going on, what the opposition is doing. You are not on the sidelines, you know, breathing easy. Trying, you're not able to see what's going on on this. And you're getting yelled at by everybody on the bleachers. So you're getting um, naysayers. You're getting gossipers. You're getting people that are mocking you for what you believe. You're getting people that are um, coming at you with scorn for what you say you heard God say, right? Like these people are mocking you. You feel stupid. You look stupid. You know, they're putting doubt in your ears because they don't believe you your God like that you thought they did and all of that. And so here you're playing this game very frustrated. You're playing this game very aggravated. You're trying to believe God, but everything is coming against you. And now you're sitting in halftime with your coach, who is God, just FYI. So as we're giving this analogy, your coach is God. So what are the, some of the things that happen during halftime? Number one, your matchups are reshuffled. Number two, problematic plays or players are thrown out. And so it's not that God's plan was not perfect since January or since whatever, whenever God gave you the play. It's that you have now become a problematic player and you have now began to make the play problematic. And so these things are now thrown out. God will possibly give you another strategy or God will tell you where you have become problematic and stupid and he needs you to re he needs to redo whatever you undid right uh what can that look like as far as a problematic player it can look like you uh, complaining a lot it can look like you murmuring remember that complaining and murmuring kept Moses and the children of Israel out of the promised land and so um what are some other problematic plays that you told all of the wrong people about what God promised you? And now you're having to fight another enemy that God never intended for you to have because he wanted you to shut up about it. What are some other problematic plays that instead of um, only speaking the word of God, you know, when I look at how Jesus defeated the devil when they were up on that mountain and the devil was trying to tempt him, he only spoke what was written. He only spoke the word of God. So some of your problematic plays is what's coming out of your mouth, that God promised you something and you keep speaking against what you say you believe God is going to do. And so you're going to have to start speaking the word of God. So again, in the locker room, matchups are reshuffled, problematic plays or players are thrown out. Another thing that happens in the locker room is a clarification on assignment is rearticulated. Clarification on assignments is rearticulated. Now, why does that have to happen possibly? Normally it happens because you had some players in the game those players got weak in faith. Those players, you know, came into unbelief. Those players became Miriam, started speaking against what God was doing. And that player had to come out. But now you feel like you have to, <clears throat> now it feels like you have to, uh, you know, overcompensate for the lack of that player's uh, position. And now you have gotten out of your position and now you are, you know, where that player is and now you're out of position. So when you go into halftime, God is clarifying your assignment and he's rearticulating where you were supposed to be. So God is like, I don't need you to go and fill in for the comp and compensate the deficit you have in your life. I'm going to fill that in. I need you to, I need you to stay on your ground. I need you to stay on your assignment. I don't need you to move. I'm going to bring another player in that is qualified and has the capacity to house what I'm building in on the inside of you. Because while people may have the capacity to hold on to what God told you for a month or two, these people don't often have the capacity to walk with you and what God said, because a lot of people walk by what they see and not by what God said, right? And so God is reshuffling the players in your game during your halftime season, but he's going to clarify your assignment. And he's going to rearticulate your assignment so that you know, hey, I don't need you to budge from this place. Another thing that happens in halftime is one to two new plays are discussed as potential options. So you're not going to listen to God, your coach, and he's going to tell you, you know, these are the next few plays that you're going to do. And then last but not least, but one of the most important things that happens in halftime is that a powerful speech is given, a powerful winning speech is given from the coach to the player. Now, one of the things I want you to notice is that during halftime, the players aren't doing a whole lot of talking because they don't know how to win the game. They don't know what they're doing. But our coach, who is omnipresent, who's omniscient, who's all-knowing, who's everywhere, obviously has the play. And so during our halftime for the rest of this month, we're going to shut up. We're not going to say a word. 
We are going to, and this is not necessarily calling you to a month long fast unless the Holy Ghost is telling you to do that. But this is definitely calling you to a consecration. This is calling you to a time before God where you're going to be quiet, where you're going to sit before God, hear the voice of God, and listen to what God is saying and doing in this hour without you doing any of that. You know what I'm saying? This is what God is doing in this hour. Be quiet. Listen to the coach. And then this is what I thought was powerful. Um, this is what I thought was very, very, very powerful. Um, was that during, uh, somebody told me this, Fortune told me this, during a halftime show, because remember what I told you, I heard God say for the month of January, he said that this would be, uh, there will be a performance. What happens when you're playing a huge game? What happens when you're in halftime? There is a performance that is taking place outside of the locker room, outside of the play. There is a performance. I could not make this up if I tried. I heard God say the month of June, this was, there will be a performance. Then like not too long after I heard God say this was halftime, I did not put two and two together. But what happens while you're in halftime? There is a performance. There is a performance. There is a performance. Um, so let me let me share with you. Let's go to Luke one, Luke one forty five. I want to I want to walk you through some scripture. Uh, one of the best compliments you can give me as a teacher is to take notes. I am not a teacher that uh, I think it's so stupid that you all not all of you because some of you got some good godly sense, but I think it is stupid. Not you're stupid. But it is stupid that you want me to do all this teaching, prepare for this, and then write down the scriptures for you. Like, how much lazier can we get as a body of Christ? I'm not going to do it. So I'm going to keep this live up. But one of the best compliments you can give any teacher in your life is to have a piece of paper and a pen next to you, write down the scriptures, and study it. Like, stop wasting these people's times. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, Luke 1.45 says... And blessed, because I like scripture to back up what I heard God say, <clears throat> blessed is she that believed and blessed is she that believed for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Blessed is she that believed for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now, I want to give you a little background of what, what this was about. First of all, um, if you go up in the scripture a little bit, God, an angel of the Lord came to a man named Zacharias and told Zacharias that his wife was going to have a baby, right? His wife uh, was not able, like, I think she was old or something. I don't, I don't know what Elizabeth was. Let me see. What was Elizabeth? Was she old? Okay. Elizabeth was barren. So she had a desolate womb, right? Elizabeth was barren and she had a desolate womb. Elizabeth was barren and she had a desolate womb. You can find that in Luke 1 verse 7. It says, and they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren and they were both well stricken in age. So not only was she barren, she was old. They had two strikes against them of why this was very impossible, right? And so an angel of the Lord came to her husband and said, I'm in verse 13 now, fear not, for your prayer is heard. So I don't care how many strikes you have against you right now. I want you to know, fear not for your prayer has been heard. We are not fasting in vain. We are not praying in vain. As a matter of fact, there is no time. There is no time you have wasted in the, in the position of prayer and fasting. There is never a time you have wasted in prayer and fasting. And so verse 13, the angel of the Lord lets us know, fear not, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you will call him John. This is why I don't believe that any of you should be getting abortions. I know the world has had you think that your child is nothing in the womb until it's born. But according to this scripture, John had a name before he was born. John had a destiny before he was born. The Bible says you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. Isn't it? I think it's not strange in verse Luke 1 verse 14 where it once said her womb was desolate, right? We just talked about that in Jeremiah 33, how the land was desolate. And God said, proof that I'm restoring that land is that you're going to hear the voice of joy. Oh, this is good. I'll be trying to calm down a little bit when I be reading the Bible. I just don't know how y'all don't be getting excited reading the Bible. 
people, especially when you find yourself in a whole nother chapter and you get a whole nother revelation. Oh my gosh, I just can't take it. This is so exciting for me. This is better than Netflix. I don't know how to contain myself. Let me just breathe a little bit. We just read, guys, in Jeremiah 33, that God restored a desolate land. And he said proof of that desolation is that they're going to be a voice of joy, a voice of gladness, a voice of the bride, a voice of the bridegroom. And here we have Elizabeth with a barren womb, according to Luke 1, verse 7. Her womb was barren. And then... It says in Luke 1, 14, I'm going to give her a seed and there will be joy and there will be gladness, which is proof that God has restored the womb of this woman. Oh my God, so exciting. <sighs> anyway, verses 15 will let you know what his destiny was. He's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. He's not going to drink. He's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost, even in his mother's womb. He's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost, even in his mother's womb right? He's going to go into the, uh, he's going to go before in the spirit and power of Elijah uh, and things of that nature. Now, here's the thing. Zechariah said to the angel, whereby should I know this? For I'm old. My wife is stricken in age. The answer, the angel said to him, I'm in verse 19 now. I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and I am sent to speak unto thee and I'm here to show you these glad tidings. And because you didn't believe what I said, Zacharias, right? Because you did not believe what I said, verse 20, I'm going to make you dumb, which means that you're not going to be able to talk because sometimes God has to silence your mouth so that you don't speak against the promise that he's given you. Verse 20, oh, I never even noticed this again. Oh, this is so good. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because you didn't believe my words which shall be fulfilled in their season you guys i am actually very excited i don't know if you can tell i have preached myself happy just now i don't know what else to do god in his mercy shut up the mouth of this man who was speaking against the promise and said, until the day that this thing I said was going to happen is performed, you will not speak because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in its season. So when Zacharias came out, he couldn't talk. He couldn't speak. Blah, blah, blah. Now, I wanted to tell you that because I wanted to, I wanted you to make, I wanted it to make sense of why Luke 145 was important to us. Verse, uh, verse 36 says, and behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. So not only was like she barren, she was called barren. Can you imagine what the enemy is calling you like she was the devil had named her barren right because sometimes the enemy will identify you by what you're going through this is why i think it's so dangerous because we're in pride month right now and i just think it's so ridiculous any believer that is celebrating pride month pride is literally the king of leviathan why would you even celebrate that but anyway you know, this is why I think it's so dangerous for people to be identifying themselves by who they like to have sex with or anything of that nature. That's the most ridiculous thing you can do. The Bible says they called her barren. They called you. If they don't call you something with God calling you, it needs to go out. But the Bible says in verse 37, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Even though they call you barren and you might not be barren in the womb, but you might be barren in the area of marriage. You might be barren in the area of finances. You might be barren in the area of favor, right? Favor. Esther was not the most beautiful woman in the world. Esther carried the most favor, which made her beautiful, right? You can be barren in different areas of your life. But the Bible says that with, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Now, let me take this down to you to verse 45, which is why this makes sense. The Bible says, and blessed is she that believed. And let me stop there. Elizabeth believed God before the promise was born. 
Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Elizabeth believed God before the promise was born. This promise had not been born yet. And this woman believed what God said. So this this was not somebody that had a fulfillment of the promise yet. This was not somebody that had a manifestation of the promise yet. This was not somebody that saw the promise before her eyes. It's easy to rejoice. It's easy to believe God. It's easy to say, I trust God when the promise is in front of us. But this woman is a testimony. This woman is a sign, miracle, and a wonder for us of what it looks like to believe God before your, your promise is born. <clears throat> the Bible says, and blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now, you may say, Tiffany, <clears throat> sorry, this is the marriage fast. What does this have to do with marriage? Well, remember how I showed you guys, I use, uh, I have a physical Bible that I've been using since 2007. God, okay, let me show it to you real quick. This is my physical Bible, buy it on Amazon. Okay, I hope you, hope you can see it. It says Hebrew... Hebrew Greek Keyword Study Bible. I read the KJV at the time. I read any other version for fun, but KJV is important for me for many different reasons. This is by AMG Publishers, okay? So if you go to, to Amazon, you can find it. I've had this Bible since 2007. As you can see, it still looks in very good shape, and baby, this Bible has been through it. Do you understand me? And so I highly recommend this Bible because it is what it is. Okay, so I also use an app. It's called the Blue Letter Bible app, okay? Um, I use it on my iPhone. I heard on Android, it looks a bit different. So I'm gonna show you really quickly how I look up the words, okay? So I don't know if you can see this, probably not. I got my ring light up, but it's Luke 1, verse 45. I'm, all I'm gonna do right here is click on it, okay? The very first line, it says concordance. This is how I look up the Hebrew and Greek definitions. Anything in the Old Testament is the Hebrew definition of the word. Anything in the New Testament is the Greek definition of the word. I like to look up the words because the words tend to mean something completely different than what we think. If I did not look up what performance meant, I would just take it for face value like, oh, there's going to be a performance. That's really exciting. But when I look up the definition of the word concordance, I click right here. And I'm going to go and it's going to show me all of the words right here. So I'm going to find performance, which is, I'm going to find performance, which I put right here and I'm going to click on right here. I might want to know how to pronounce it in the Greek. Strong's G 5050. Teliosis. Teliosis. Now there's technically no reason for me to want to know that, but on occasion I do. And I look up the word performance and it means a completing. It means a perfecting. It means a fulfillment. It means an accomplishment. Uh, it means the event that verifies the promise, right? So when God says that there will be a performance of those things that I, of there will be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord, what God is saying is that there will be an event that verified what I promised you. And then for those of us are on this marriage fast, this is what I think is very powerful about this, is another word for... Um, Another word for performance is consummation. Another word for performance is consummation. You can find that right there in the Greek definition of the word. There will be a performance, or in other words, there will be a consummation of those things which were told her from the Lord. Many of us know what consummation is, but in case you do not, a consummation is the action of making a marriage complete by having sexual intercourse. It is the action of making a marriage complete by having sexual intercourse. The synonyms of consummation are completion, accomplishment, performance, conclusion. Guys, I'm telling you, I don't know if this is blessing you, but it sure is blessing me. So blessed is she that believes. Blessed is the person that believes before the promise even comes. For there will be a performance, or in other words, there will be an event that verifies the promise. There will be a consummation. You will consummate your marriage by having some good sex. Okay, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's going to be good. Of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now... 
You got to start asking yourself, what did God tell you? Because this promise is about what God told you. So what did God tell you? And some of the things I want you to, to know is like, go, to, go with me to Psalms 84 verse 30. Or is it 84? 86. Go with me to Psalms 86. Shoot, where is it? Is it Psalms 84? Okay, Psalms 89. Psalms 89. Psalms 89. Go with me to Psalms 89, verse 34. Psalms 89, verse 34. The Bible says, my covenant will I not break. So you have to understand that anything that God says, it, it, when he says, there will be a performance of those things which I, which were told her by the Lord. You have to, you have to, you have to set some things in your life about what God said to you, right? Number one, God cannot lie. It's impossible. Number two, according to Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man be a liar if it comes up against the word of God, right? God cannot lie. Number three, according to Isaiah 55, his word will not return to him void. The Bible says just like, like you ever, you ever see the rain, the next time it rains, I want you to just watch the rain because what God never does with the rain is he never has the rain come down. And then he says, oh, halfway through, I changed my mind. We never see the rain go back up. We never see the snow go back up, right? We never see that happen. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, just like he does with water, with rain and snow, that it goes down to accomplish like watering the earth, so shall his word be that his word will come down to accomplish what he sent to it to do. God would never give a word, send it halfway down and say, oh, I changed my mind. Let me, no. Whenever God gives you a prophetic word, it's literally, you can count on it like snow and water. It's going to come down to do exactly what it was intended to do, which was water the earth or water your life. Like these are some things you have to know for sure or concerning the prophetic word that God gave you. And another thing that, you know, I've been holding on to is Psalms 89 verse 34. The Bible says, my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. My covenant will I not break nor alter the things that have gone out of my lips. My covenant will I not break nor will I alter the things which gone out of my lips. When I look up the word lips, it means binding. God's word is binding. God is bound to his word. And that's just is what it is. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, um, and then let's go back to Luke 1, 45 really quickly. And then the last part of it is, which were told her from the Lord. Now I want you all, you know, because I do understand that sometimes when, you know, the Bible says the heart deferred makes the heart sick. And so if you've been hoping for something, hope deferred makes the heart sick. If you've been hoping for something for a while, your heart and your hope has gone sick. And then you have trust issues with God and you're trying to still love God. But the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God, but you can't have faith if you don't trust God anymore. And we have to often go back to that place where trust was broken with God, right? And a lot of that is just God you know, going back and saying, God, I really had hope in this area. It didn't come through like I thought it was going to come through and I lost trust in you. Right. And so uh, when it says these things were told her from the Lord and you have a trust deficit or you're in the halftime kind of getting your trust bandage wounded up, you know, your trust wound bandaged up. Well, then you might want to go back to see who God is. Right. That's not bad bad for you to do and say, God, I need to revamp my relationship with you. Because if you, if you told me this, I need to go back to see who you were. The first thing I want you to know is according to first Corinthians 14, 33, again, that's first Corinthians 14, 33. Again, that is first Corinthians 14, 33 for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. So if right now you're dealing with the spirit of confusion concerning your situation, we know that God is not in control of that. I looked up the word definition of the word confusion and it means instability. God is not the author of instability. God is not the author of the state of disorder, which is also what confusion means. 
It also means disturbance. God is not the author of disturbance, right? God is not the author of this commotion. So he is not the author of confusion. Now, what God is, right, is go to with me to Hebrew 12, verse 2. The Bible says that Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So he is not the author of confusion, but he is the author of the fin and finisher of our faith. Now, what does that have to do, Tiffany, with you know, Luke 145, when it says that the, the, there's going to be an event that verifies the promise of these things that were told you from God, I need you to know that God is not the author of confusion. So anytime you have instability in a situation, your peace is being disturbed, God is not there. But he is the author and the finisher of your faith, which means that God, the only true and living God, is writing out your love story, is writing out the story that is for you and the man or woman that God has ordained for you in your life for the rest of your life, right? Like this is God who is writing this story out. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. So this means that blessed is she that believed, meaning that you are believing this thing before you even seen it. He said, the, the authoring and the finishing that I'm gonna do is according to your faith, which means that during your halftime, you want God to bandage up your trust wound. Okay. For who the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despiting the shame that was set down on the right hand of the father. Like you can read all that on your own, but good stuff. I'm going to tell you what, this is just, I just preached myself good. I'm going to go and skip on out today. And then, so let me say this for the rest of your halftime, this is what I want you to do for the rest of your halftime, for the rest of this month, I want you to take notes, right? Because you're going in with your coach. You're going to be quiet. You're going in to see, you know, what you did, what you're doing wrong. You're going to go in for the next set of plays. You're going to ask God to rearticulate and confirm your assignment for you again. I want you for the rest of this month to go into a consecration. Stay low. Be quiet. Don't be on social media too much. You know, I want you to uh, just take notes and allow God to talk to you. Remember, as a player, in halftime, you are not doing all of the talking. You are allowing your coach to talk to you. The second thing I want you to do is to assess your injuries while you're in halftime, right? And again, one of the biggest injuries I think many of us have is the trust wound, right? Those trust wounds are really tearing you apart because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so I want you to go in there and assess where the trust with God was broken. Ask the Holy Spirit to let you know where that was so that that can be repaired during this halftime season so that the next, you know, the next two quarters of the game, you're going to win. Uh, the next thing I want you to do during your halftime season is to allow God to praise you. Now, you're not doing everything wrong. Some, Maybe some of you are, but you're not doing everything wrong. And so you want to allow God during your halftime season to tell you what you're doing right, right? Just, I think some of us are so bad at criticizing ourselves all the time and you know, always so hard on yourself and never giving yourself any grace for what you are doing right. Everything is always wrong. You're beating yourself up. A lot of y'all learned that from your parents who were never nice to you, always criticizing you. A lot of you learned that from people y'all wasn't ever supposed to date anyway, who always criticized you. I want you during your half time to sit down, be quiet and allow your father, who is your coach, to praise you, to tell you where you were doing good at. Even if you did 20 things wrong, there should be three things that you did right, hopefully, right? Like you got up and tried again. I don't know what it is. Maybe you did everything wrong, but you got up and you said, God, I'm going to do it again. Maybe you repented. I don't know. But allow God to praise you and to tell you what you're doing good and to pat you on the back, you know, um, because you're not bad and you're not doing everything wrong. And then um, the next part of your halftime is God is going to pick your team. So he's going to tell you what players need to stay. He's going to tell you what players need to be benched. He's going to tell you what players are like spies working for the other team. He's going to tell you what players from the other team are working for you. And you just want to be quiet to, um, to know what teams you're going to do. And then the last thing you're going to do while you're out is you're going to run back out into the game inspired. You're going to run back out to the game, listening to God, getting the best halftime speech of your life and feeling like you can um, 
overcome the world because of what your dad, the coach said to you. So this is what your instructions are for the rest of this month. I believe that this is a very strong prophetic word for the month of June. And I believe that this is also a warning for the month of June. Um, on just you just staying low, being quiet, consecrating yourself before God. And this is why I say it doesn't really matter. I think that this this word is very staple to the month of June. But in case you read this, uh, are watching this um, in September or December or January or August or whatever month, I want you to know that at any time you look at your life and you see it's going down the wrong course, you can go into a supernatural halftime and you can always implement this time and ask God for a course correction and say, God, I need you to turn things around. Now, before we leave, because I'm finna let you go in a second, but before I go, I want to give you scripture of where I thought was a great uh, analogy in the Bible of a halftime where it looked like you know, this person was getting ready to lose. They went to God during their halftime season and they took uh, they took the victory. If you go with me to first Samuel chapter 30, we're going to read about Samuel who was came back from a war, um, obviously pretty tired, thinking that he's going to have some good sex with both of his wives, thinking he's going to eat some great food, play with his kids a little bit, only to come back to Ziglag to find out that the Amalekites had done burned down everything, okay? I just, he ain't getting nothing, okay? He ain't getting, nobody's there to get anything from. Everybody's gone. The whole village is burnt down. The wives are gone. The children are gone. Everybody's gone, okay? Did I say, who did I say? I think I said David. Did I not say David? Sorry. David, if I didn't say David, 1 Samuel 30. David is pretty upset about this. So this is David. If you go with me to 1 Samuel 30. No, I meant, I meant to say 1 Samuel 30, guys. That's where the story is. It's 1 Samuel 30. Okay, sorry about that. It's 1 Samuel 30, and the man's name is David. Okay, 1 Samuel 30. The man's name is David. First Samuel 30, the man's name is David. My bad. So we look in this story. David um, is back from war. Everybody is stolen. We're going to go down to verse 3. David and his men came to the city. It was burned. Uh, their wives, their sons, their daughters were taken captives. Verse four says, then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Now, I don't know if you all have cried the cry of your life. I've cried that cry before. I cried that cry so hard one day with my sister friend on the phone. She just screenshot me and she'd be sending me the picture sometimes to remind me that there was a time in my life that I cried the cry of my life. Now, understand that they said until they had no more power to weep. I don't know if you've ever cried that kind of cry before, but there is a cry that can come so strong out of you that you don't even have any more power to weep. This is the cry that these people cried. The Bible says in verse six, and David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him, that there is a place of your soul being so grieved if you read in verse six, the Bible says, because the soul of all the people were grieved, they wanted to stone David, who was not in charge of everybody being stolen, just FYI. But there's just a place you can go to where your soul is so grieved that you want to kill somebody who is not responsible for the wrongdoing in your life, right? David was stressed out, though, because these people wanted to kill him. And... Verse eight says, David inquired of the Lord and said, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And God answered him back and said, pursue for thou shall surely overtake them. And without fail, you're going to recover all. So I want you to know that during his halftime, remember what I said, what happens sometimes during halftimes. Um, I said, there are random outbursts of emotions. I didn't even, I didn't even get a revelation of this until now. This is actually the perfect story of a halftime story in the Bible. First Samuel chapter 30, David's story. What did I say happens during halftime? Random outbursts 
outbursts of emotions, heated altercations. And what did we just learn here in verse uh, four and then in verse six, they had wept until they had no more power to weep. And in verse six, they were talking about stoning David because their souls were grieved, right? So this is the epitome of a great halftime. And so what he did was during his halftime, he went and inquired of his coach, or in other words, God. And the Bible says, God answered him and said, you're going to surely overtake them. And without fail, you're going to recover all. So David went with um, 600 men. He ended up having to knock 200 of them down because they were too tired and weak and faint. Uh, so they could not fight with him. And here's what I love about this. I don't believe that David actually had to ask God, right? I think in David's wisdom, he asked God what he should do because David knew that without asking God, he, David was a warrior. He could have gone, he could have won, but I believe that David you know, wanted the backing of God for this because I believe that David understood that he didn't have even the strength to win this by himself. So I believe that there are so many wars that we know we can win in our own flesh that we are in right standing of winning. You know, David asked a question that I think was common sense. Of course, you can go and win this war. These are your people. These are your children. Why are you asking God, should you pursue this, right? But David in his wisdom um, went and asked God, you know, what do you want me to do? You know, common sense tells me I'm in right standing. I have the right to go fight this. But God, I don't want to go into this war without you. I'm already tired. I'm I'm already grieved in spirit. And you know, when you're grieved in spirit, it really wipes out your natural strength. And he went to God and he said, what do you want me to do? And I think that this is also part of your halftime strategy that even though it's common sense that what somebody did to you, you know, it's common sense that you're, you should go and be able to fight that. But I want you to just surrender to God, yield yourself to God and say, God, what do you want me to do in this situation? I know what you said. I know what you said. I know what you said, but should I pursue? And I want you to wait during your halftime season for God to give the answer. Because here's the thing that I thought was powerful. When God gave him the answer that you're going to pursue and over, um, that you're going to pursue and without fail recover all, the Bible says that when they were going on the journey to go find their people, they ran into an Egyptian and they fed him cake and raisins and this guy ate and his spirit came back to him because he had not drunk any water or eaten any food for three days. What does that mean? This man was in an involuntary dry fast for three days. So God had put on their path somebody who was fasting because, you know, David, I'm mean, sorry, Paul, when, when he was Saul on a street called Straight on the Road to Damascus, Apostle Paul, before he was Apostle Paul, was a Hitler of his time. For those of you that don't know, he was a Saddam Hussein. He was a Christian killer. He killed wives. He killed men, women, and children. And God stopped him on a street called Straight on the Road to Damascus while he was on his way to a man named Ananias' village to kill all of them. God um, struck him with blindness. And the Bible says that he did not eat or drink for three days. He also went on an involuntary fast. This was not something he chose to do on his own. He fasted whether he wanted to fast or not. So God will put people on your path um, in an involuntary fast to help you out when you are going with the backing of God. This man was on an involuntary fast. And the Bible says, who do you belong to? The David says, ask the Egyptian, who do you belong to? And the man says, I'm a young Egyptian servant to the Amalekites. These are the same people that came and stole all of David's people. Um, he said, my master left me because for three days he fell sick. Uh, they, he said that we had an invasion upon this land and we burned down Ziglag with fire. David said to him in verse 15, can you bring me to this company? And he said, if you swear to me by God that you will not kill me and you won't deliver me to the hands of the people I'm finna snitch on, I'll bring you to this company. And the Bible says, of course, the Egyptian brought them down. David, in verse 18, recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. David rescued his wives. Verse 19, there was nothing lacking to them, neither great nor small, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered it all. David recovered it all. Now, uh, and give me three minutes to break this down for you. Uh, when, when the Bible says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. Did I forget to tell y'all that part? Where is that part at? David encouraged himself in the Lord. 
Okay, sorry about that. In verse six, the Bible says, but David encouraged himself of the Lord. I don't know how I forgot that part because this, this is very important. Before David inquired of God what he should do, he encouraged himself in God. And when I looked up the definition of, of the word encouraged, it means David strengthened himself in God. David hardened himself in God. David secured himself in God. David prevailed himself in God. David made himself bold in God. David withstood himself in God. David repaired himself in God. These are all words that happened during halftime. He re the word encouraged also means to repair. David repaired himself in God because sometimes when you have experienced such a strong st blow from the enemy, like coming home and everybody's been kidnapped, you know, that's a blow. And David needed to encourage himself in God. And how do you encourage yourself in God? You do that by reminding yourself of how God came through for you before. You do that by reminding yourself of how God delivered you in the past. You do that by taking yourself back to the journey of how God, you know, uh, made a way of escape for you. Because all of the times it's so hard for you to look at what's going on now and say like, God is gonna come through for you and God is really gonna make this thing come to pass. But then when you think back and say, you know what, God, I remember when, you know, I was in a situation that looked dire. It looked impossible. Like everybody and everything said that this would not come to pass. And you came through for me with an 11th hour miracle, God. And it astounded everybody. It shut up the mouths of everybody that mocked me, that scorned me. And it glorified you, Father. I remember when you made a way of escape for me out of this situation that looked impossible. I remember, God, when... You know, the doctor may have told you that you weren't going to live. And here you are 13 years later, still standing, still eating and all of that stuff. Like you have to take yourself back to the past victories that God did. You need to write them down during your halftime victory and say, you know what, God, I forgot what you did to me, for me. I repent for forgetting what you did for me, God. You know, maybe you went through childbirth and your baby wasn't even supposed to live. And now your baby is 10 years old thriving. Like, I don't know what your thing is, but God has delivered you from past victory. So you encourage yourself in the Lord by reminding yourself what God did from you. And then after you have secured yourself in God, after you have repaired that trust breach that happened, right? After you have... Um, withstood with the enemy, the blow the enemy tried to give you. After you secured yourself in God, after you've encouraged yourself in the Lord, then you say, God, what do you want me to do? Because I am fully persuaded that whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do because now I have secured myself in you. I can now inquire in what you want me to do because it's hard to inquire in a God you don't trust. It's hard to inquire in a God that you don't think is going to come through. It's hard to inquire in a God that you think has forgotten about you and no longer hears about you. So that's why it's important for you to, to encourage yourself in God before you inquire of God, because after you remind yourself of the God that cannot fail, the God that cannot lose, the God that is the only true and living God, the God that answers by fire, that's when you can say, okay, God, cool. Tell me what you, you want me to pursue. Because now that I, I'm fully persuaded that you have my back, I'm fully persuaded that this is what it is and I cannot lose. I'm fully persuaded that the covenant you made with me, you will not break, nor the word that you gave me will not alter from your lips because they're binding. I believe everything that you're going to say out of your mouth. The trust has been repaired. The breach of trust has been repaired. I believe you. Tell me what you do. And I also want to leave you with this. David could not have won that war unless he went out to win it. So there was also something David had to do to win. The, the promise was fulfilled because he went out to do it. So I don't know what God is telling you to do, but it's also very important that you all, you know, are obedient to the next set of instructions that God gives. So this is the month of halftime. God is doing something very powerful in your life. And just remember that during your halftime, y'all, there will be a performance. God is not a liar. And I pray to God that this word has encouraged you. I pray that this has lifted you up. I pray that this word is like the oil of joy for the spirit of heaviness. I want you to know that God has not forgotten about you, that he has heard your prayers and that, you know, you just want to praise and celebrate and just be joyous for what God has done. I want to encourage you to share this live. Text this link to the last five people you texted this week. Even if they're not believers, you will be surprised about how God deals with people concerning these lives. 
The Bible says that one man plants, another man waters, but ultimately it's God that gives the increase. And I believe that you texting this link, this live link to the last five people you texted this week is you planting a seed. For others, is you watering a seed somebody else planted last week or two that you don't know about. And ultimately, God is going to give the increase. So please don't, don't hoard this good word to yourself because this word is good. Do you understand me? This is good. Don't hoard this to yourself. Share this out. Even if you don't think people are going to believe it or hear it or listen to it, you'd be surprised as to the small secret prayers that God gives out to God and how this live will be the answer for that. If you want more information about me and the ministry God has gifted me called Covered by God, please go to coveredbygod.co. Again, that is coveredbygod.co. We are a praying and fasting ministry. We're also a prophetic and teaching ministry, and we meet once a month. Uh, in whatever location God tells us to meet in. We just came back from Houston, Texas. And less than a month ago, we were in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, we often meet in Atlanta, Georgia. And I only go where God sends me. So you will never be able to say, Tiffany, please come to my city. Please come to my state. It is better for you to get on a flight and come to us. But I will never come anywhere that you tell me to come. I This ministry is led by the Holy Ghost. I find that I have great provision and great protection only going where God sends me. And so when God tells me to go to a certain region, a certain land, a certain nation, a certain state, that is where I'm going. But I'm never going because you asked me to come. So please stop. Go to coveredbygod.co. Again, that is coveredbygod.co. I think that is all my announcements for today. Follow me on Instagram at Tiffany Montgomery. I love you guys to life and God bless you all. God bless you.